What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Welcome back everyone to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. Today we had the absolute privilege of having Claire Tuning, registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor and peanut butter and jelly lover. I just feel like that's important to state on the podcast for the second time. Um, She is an OG of ours and fun fact, if you haven't listened to that first episode, I actually met Claire years and years ago when we were both in the same business mentorship and she's always been someone who has inspired me um she is so incredibly well spoken and she is so well versed on everything intuitive eating and she has started her career and maintained her career in intuitive eating and this episode if you listen to our first one with claire and then this one it's just like it's incredible to see her growth as well um like just everything that she said today sam i know you agree was just like she didn't even have to think like the answers were just there. Like she just knows it all from personal experience and client experience that happened yesterday. Like it's just all so fluid. Um, and so this episode was a really good one. Yes. And she is, I don't, I forget if I told you, but when I met her in person, it was like what I always speak about when I like broke down crying and like had <laughs> like this moment of like, what am I doing with my life? Um, with my mentors, but she was at that same conference with me and she was just so calm, cool and collected back then. And I feel like she always is like that. We can always count on her for just such an amazing message. And so this episode is 100% Halloween themed, but like we said, with all of the conversations today, even though we're really using candy as like that fear forbidden food and all of these conversations, you can easily transfer this conversation about pizza, right? Or about carbohydrates in general, or about any fear food that you have in your life. Um, so whether you have fear foods or forbidden foods, whether you struggle with just how to kind of walk the line with your child's relationship with food. I feel like this is just such a great episode for really anybody. So like we always say, like, I'm just going to stop talking and we're going to get into it because it's such a good episode. So here is Claire Tuning. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. Today, we are freaking excited because we have a repeat offender on the podcast, someone who has been <laughs> here for the second time. She was on uh, season one with us way back when, when COVID like literally just started. Um, but for season two, we're happy to have her back. So thank you for being here, Claire Tuning. Hi, Sam and Jenna. I'm really excited to be here. You know, repeat offender here. Happy to, <laughs> happy to be back. She was here when we were drunk dietitians. That's I how long ago. I was. I was. I remember um, for recording that podcast, I poured my seltzer water into a wine glass and I was cheersing all the way home. It was a good time. <laughs> I love it. I know when we would interview people on like a Friday morning, like some people would like come and like, who was it? Was it Tony, Tony Castillo? It was like <laughs> pounding <laughs> tequila drinks like on a mor- like a morning, and then people like yourself and us, we would like drink a Lacroix out of a wine glass and like. <laughs> I then love once, both of them. <laughs> yes, but then once we realized we were pretending to drink for every episode, we were like, "Why are we called drunk dietitians?" Yeah, you're like, maybe we should rebrand. We should rethink the name. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for so, so many reasons. <laughs> yes. So if anybody wants to hear your story, we'll have, we'll just send them back. We'll link your first episode in our show notes because we don't want to 
maybe, you know, continue to dive deep in there when we already kind of know that. What I love about you and I say all the time is like, you're one yes. of the only <laughs> dietitians that I know that was like rooted in intuitive eating from the get-go, has stayed intuitive eating. You never had to walk the, uh, what is it, diet culture, weight-centric years of uh counseling like Jenna and I. So we love that about you. Um, but we want to do all things Halloween today because Halloween is literally right around the corner. So to start out, I think we just need to ask the most important question of what is your favorite Halloween candy? Can I say something before I answer that question? Please do. Okay. I have to, it's just now clicking with me. So I did not know until this moment or until, you know, before we hit record, that we were going to do all things Halloween. And I have to say yesterday I went like full fall in my house. I put up the pumpkins. I put out the thing that holds the Halloween candy in my house. It doesn't have candy in it yet, but I feel like I spent yesterday preparing for this conversation when I didn't even know it was going to happen. So had to add that in there, but my and to be. favorite meant to be. <laughs> My favorite Halloween candy, which will probably not be a surprise for anyone who knows anything about me, but a Reese's peanut butter cup. If they made them with peanut butter and jelly on the inside, I would definitely be down, but Reese's 10 out of 10. I like, I like sour candies as well, but I definitely lean in the, the chocolate direction more. I feel like this is something that you need to create. Like there's no peanut butter and jelly Reese's cup until now. And nobody steal this idea. This is Claire's. I'm regretting saying this on, <laughs> on something that's recorded. Yes. But uh, yeah, that would be, that would be delicious. I feel like I, um, I've tried to make like homemade versions, you know, with the little muffin tins and you layer, but it ends up being really messy and I'm not much of a baker. So maybe, maybe we'll have to contact some sort of a agency that can do this for me. <laughs> And before we dive into all things Halloween, I have to tell you, and I thought about you this summer, I should have texted you. I had my very first Uncrustable sandwich okay. on the beach. I had never had them before. I don't know why. And I was like, like, how is this my first experience? This is literally heaven. It's like the best peanut butter ever. Um, it's like perfectly like smushy bread. Oh, just mm -hmm. everything about it. I know I gave my husband a bite of it because he was like, he wanted to try it. And I was like like gave him like a little baby inch of the corner. <laughs> it was so good. And it was the only one we had. Um, but like, wow, made me think right of you. Yeah, that's, a, I'm a little disappointed that you have made know. it however many years of life without many. That's a, <laughs> a little surprising, but we'll, we'll let you slide. As long as you've tried them now, that's all that matters. <laughs> Never going back to making my own, just saying. <laughs> I used to crush Uncrustables in high school like that was my jam I cannot believe you're just having like you just had that now Jenna. Sure. I don't I, I don't know what's wrong with me and I don't know what's wrong with my parents for not giving them to me. <laughs> they're um they're really good I don't know are they sold frozen I'm having a brain lapse. yes yeah I was, they're actually really yummy if you like bring them out of the freezer just for like a couple of minutes so you're not biting into like a rock hard puck of peanut butter and jelly but like when they're still a little cold and like crunchy because they're frozen it's so yummy especially in the summer yeah so good yeah so on the beach any, it was like perfect if anybody, <laughs> anyway, <I'm done. laughs> if anybody works for Uncrustables you can't we will be invoicing you for this unpaid <laughs> advertisement that we just did yes we will yeah um, <laughs> but that's amazing and I yes you need to create a peanut butter and jelly Reese's cup because now that sounds really good. But we have to jump in because this time of year, I know we are three intuitive eating dietitians and counselors, and we get so many questions around Halloween candy and restriction and all of the things. So we know that parents want the best for their children, right? They have their children and their, their, their best interests. So I would love to ask you, Claire, when you have clients that are like, okay, well, I have to hide the Halloween candy from my children because they just eat too much candy. How do you respond to that? Like, where do you start? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways we could go with this, especially since um, parents have their own relationship with food as well. So I'm almost more tempted simply because 
I, I do not have children myself. I know Jenna, you do at Noah. He's so cute. Um, but I'm almost tempted, like when I get this question from a parent or from a caregiver to kind of address maybe a couple of things about their relationship with food, just ask a couple of questions because inevitably their kids are probably picking up on the language that they're using around candy, the behaviors, feeling like it's bad or it has to be hidden. And oftentimes when we feel as though we can't have a certain food around or we feel out of control around a certain food, it is because there's a lack of permission or there are rules for whatever reason around that food. And when we break those rules, because as we know, that's not sustainable to think that we're going to live in a world where we never come across candy. <laughs> Halloween is a holiday that repeats. Um, when we break one of those rules and we have a binge or we have a moment where we feel really out of control around food, that only reinforces the narrative of, oh yeah, I can't be trusted around this food, so I have to hide it. So first and foremost, if anyone is feeling compelled to hide the candy or I can't even bring this into my house or don't even get me started on the houses that hand out like an eraser. I, listen, I know we need erasers, like this is fun and all, but you know, if you're feeling that you can't have candy in your house, I think it can be useful to start getting curious around why that is. Are we lacking permission? What narrative are we having around candy? And then we can start there. Um, does that answer your question? We can go deeper for sure. <clears throat> Definitely answers the question. <laughs> and I think I love how you started that with let's go to the parents' relationship with food first, because I can't tell you how many times we get people coming and saying, my child is sneaking candy or, or I'm finding, you know, wrappers in their room or all of this stuff. And again, I'll do that same thing where it's like, okay, let's look at our relationship with food first, because our children are picking up from there. Um, so I think that's a wonderful, wonderful piece of advice and place to start. Yeah. And one thing I'll add, um, to this is kind of like off to the, the side of the question that you asked, but I talk with my adult clients about this all the time. And I'm wondering if it could maybe be helpful to start having these conversations with kids as well, like really being thoughtful about the words we use to describe candy. So instead of saying that's bad, or you can only have one, or you can earn your candy by eating this food first, what might it be like if we used more neutral descriptors of that candy? So like when you're having a piece of candy with your kid, like, hey, what does this taste like? Of course, knowing that their vocabulary is going to differ <laughs> based on how old they might be, but I noticed this is really crunchy or, oh, this has a peanut in it. It reminds me of peanut butter and jelly, right? Just trying to engage in conversation that is age appropriate with neutral and descriptive terms, teaching them that this can be an experience where we explore flavor and texture, much like we would if we were talking about another food that we're eating at the dinner table, right? It doesn't have to be a reward, doesn't have to be something that we speak about in moralizing terms. It can be something that we enjoy and we converse over, like we have a conversation about it, not this is so bad, we have to hide it because kids are gonna pick up on that. And then of course their behaviors are gonna feel chaotic around them. They're gonna feel like they have to eat it in their room. So I think trying as best as we can to open up an environment where we can talk about these foods in a neutral way could be really helpful. I feel like I had a comment and then you just answered all of it. <laughs> that beautiful. <laughs> statement there and this is like exactly how our previous podcast was where Sam and I were just in awe of how just well spoken and well versed you are in every single topic when it comes to intuitive oh, eating thank you. Um, so it's an absolute privilege to have you on here and I love that you set the tone with that conversation that you do that activity with adults as well as mm -hmm. recommending it right now to children and I think that's something that I just want to repeat for our listeners because that type of activity with a sweet food or a salty food or any type of food is something that I feel like people, when they hear that, they don't think of the impact that it could possibly or potentially have. But can you share, you know, clients that you've had that activity or done that activity with some outcomes that maybe they have felt or that they've experienced um, afterwards? Because I think that like this, it's so powerful. 
Yeah. And two, I want to reiterate that like we do this with all foods. Like, yeah, you can do it with candy and you can also do it with a vegetable that you're eating or a fruit or, or grains. But yeah, it's interesting that you ask for the outcome from a client. One of my newest clients, at least as we are recording this episode, we had this conversation actually at the end of one of our first calls. And I, I brought this idea up to her as an intention or a goal we could set. And whenever I set a goal with my clients, I always like to check in, like, how, like, how does that feel? How do we feel moving into the next couple of weeks? And she goes, Claire, I, I have to be honest. I don't know if this is going to work or I don't know if this will be helpful. And I said, thanks for your feedback. Like, I'm really grateful for that. Are you open to trying? Like, and we'll give it a shot. If you hate it, we can reconvene in a couple of weeks and we can try something different. She's like, yep, of course I'm open to trying. And she sends me a message in the off week in between our, our sessions being really surprised in a pleasant way of how just giving herself the opportunity to describe the food in a more neutral way. Like, um, what does this food look like to me? What does the texture feel like in my mouth? She's like, I, I thought this was going to be kind of silly or it was going to be weird, but she found that it actually helped her just kind of like turn the volume down on the food police and turn the volume up on, well, how is this food feeling for me? Do I even enjoy this food? She actually told me that um, it helped her as well to reconnect to some of her preferences around food, noting that, you know, in order to feel satisfied in a lot of her meals, she realized she needed like a crunchy component, right? Not just something smooth. So it helped her not only like shift the narrative a little bit around food, but it reconnected her to what she likes and what she enjoys. So she was pleasantly surprised, which this is one of the reasons why I love something like this. I love right before you said the words food police, you were making me think of so much of this kind of goes back to that principle and in intuitive eating of challenging the food police and recognizing mm -hmm that narrative that we have around food. And I think so often people think that those voices that exist in their head around food of like, you shouldn't be eating that. How could you eat this? Why would you eat this? This is so bad. Like all of those food police voices, they're not permanent residents and they don't have to be. But I feel like for so many people when they've been dieting for so long, that's all they know. And so like you were saying, you're challenging them to find that food anthropologist and that like natural observer mm -hmm. that can just name neutral things about food and that can shift the narrative and then change the behavior in such a pleasant way. And so I love, like Jenna said, it's always a privilege having you here because I think like eloquent is the way I would describe Claire. Like when she speaks, like I'm over here dropping F-bombs. So now I feel so like you get so excited. When you talk about <laughs> and Claire is just like eloquent. And so oh, just, thank you. you just bring it all together, which I love. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I had I had one other um, one other thought as you were just talking about the um, the food policing voice. Oh, it's totally slipping my mind. I had a thought that I was if it comes back to me, I will gladly we'll interrupt back. one of you two and bring it back in. But thank you very much for your kind words. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go based off of. I believe that you mentioned this within your, your eloquent statement about preferences. And, you know, we had a listener question the other day in our DMs about food rules versus food preferences. And, you know, I think it's really a difficult or what's the right word? It's like, there's a lot of gray area when you're starting this process versus of what is a preference truly versus a rule. And before we started recording, we were talking about like, do you actually like the Justin's Almond Butter Cup or do you choose that product because you don't allow yourself to have a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup? And we can use this with all sorts of products. I used to tell people that I actually really loved Gigi crackers. I tolerated them. I did not love them. But that was my food rule at the time, not a preference, right? So like on this topic here, can we dive deeper into how you would walk someone through that conversation? Absolutely. <laughs> and before we dive in there, Jenna, I have to say, since you brought up the crackers, <laughs> I, have, I have to say, 
when when I met you, Jenna, because I knew you before I knew Sam. When I met you, you I was a mess. <laughs> you were still you were still you were not a mess. You were in the Gigi Cracker phase, and I remember. I think we were at okay. like um, a conference or a gathering, and I believe you like you had them on your person, and you like oh, yeah. whipped them out, and I was like, "What are those?" Like, I made my mom, Grace, our friend, eat them because he was so hungry, and I was like, "Hold on, let me make you a sandwich," and like yeah. pulled them out of my purse. Yeah, and <laughs> internally, I was like, "I don't want to yuck anyone's yum. I've never had those. I cannot speak as if they are delicious or not." But I was like what are those crackers? So I had, had never seen those until you brought them up, but um, they did look a little cardboard. Like wood. Like, they're like, they're yeah. like wood chips. <laughs> like. Yeah, but, um, but hey, I guess to tie this in, if those are truly a preference, absolutely nothing wrong right. with them. But if that is coming, if your choice to have a food like that or choose something like the, the Justin's peanut butter cup over the Reese's, if that is coming from a sense of obligation, meaning I have to choose this, this is the healthiest, I am bad if I choose the other option, that's where we need to ask a, a couple of questions. Because something I tell my clients all the time is it's not our food choices that matter most. It's our intentions behind them. So someone, I don't, I just ate lunch, right? Someone could choose to have something like a salad because they are craving something crunchy, something refreshing. It's what they have available to them and it's what they find satisfying. And that's great. Someone else could be choosing a salad because they feel like they have to. That's the only food allowed. They're going to feel guilty if they eat anything else. So the choice on the outside could look the same, but these are two very different intentions. One that I would argue is a healthy intention of wanting to find satisfaction, eating what's accessible, eating something that makes you feel pleasant. The latter intention that I was listing out, I would argue that's coming from a place of inflexibility, from guilt, from, again, a, an obligation to the food police. So I think the thing that we have to look for in trying to decide, am I choosing this based on preference or based on a food rule, is how much flexibility we have within that. You can be flexible saying, hey, sometimes I choose this food and it's great. Sometimes I choose the other one and that's also great. That's, you know, coming from a place of positive intention. But if we have no flexibility, if all of our choices have to be this way, we're very militaristic, I would argue that's kind of where we get to the slippery slope of some potentially disordered eating behaviors, for sure. Again, so eloquently said. Mm -hmm. And so let's take that a step further of, you know, we kind of talked a little bit about parents and their relationship with food versus children. And so, so the houses that hand out raisins or erasers or pens or whatever it is um because it's the air quotes healthier choice now again let's obviously like you're not eating erasers and pens and those things we hope not we hope not <laughs> yes <laughs> but so or even if we go back to our justin's peanut butter cup versus reese's cup if a if a parent or a caregiver is saying well we're only gonna have these Justin's cups in the house because they're air quotes healthier than the Reese's cup. How would you kind of respond to that? Or I, I guess we, we talked about it with being a preference versus a choice, but what are, what are your kind of thoughts on that to a parent who's choosing to bring only the air quotes healthier options in the house? Yeah. Well, first I would say, I mean, I think all parents everywhere Again, I am not a parent, but from what I have learned from all of my parent friends, they're all doing the absolute best that they can with what they have, right? So if that is genuinely their preference, or if that's just what they're choosing to have around for whatever reason, it's great that there's food there, like period, end of sentence. Um, and at the same time, if that's coming from that place of like rigidity of like, I'm only allowing my kids to have this candy, Sure, you can control to a certain extent what happens in your household, but we also live in a world where if your kids are going to a Halloween party, if they're going to someone else's home, they're probably going to be exposed to other foods then, right? And um, 
I, this is actually really interesting. This, I haven't thought of this in such a long time, but since we're talking about candy, I can bring um, a little anecdote from my, my experience as a child that I once was. Um, I had an open candy jar policy in my house growing up. And I have to give my parents so much credit for this. I feel so privileged to have been able to grow up in this environment where there was, a, I mean, it is what it sounds like. There was a jar of candy in this house that sat there. I could go to it when I wanted. I could have two pieces one day. I could have no pieces the next day. It was not policed. I was not told that it was bad. I was not told that I shouldn't have it. And as a result, the candy just like sat there. Like seriously, I would come home from Halloween trick-or-treating with my friends. I would, would of course eat the candy. I would enjoy it. And then it would get tucked away in the pantry in this candy jar. And come next Halloween, there would be like some stale pieces of candy at the bottom because you just forget about it, right? Because I knew it was always there. I was always going to be allowed to have it. But interestingly enough, and this gets back to what I was saying about your kids eventually going out to other people's homes and being exposed to foods that they might not have at home and how exciting that can be. I would always be kind of like confused. I mean, I understand why now, but as a child, I would be confused as to why when a lot of my friends would come over, they would get so excited about this candy jar. They were like, what? Like you can do it whenever you want. And they would go nuts in a way with the can literally if there was like a payday and you know, or like a, a Reese's, but they would go nuts with the candy. And that's like all they wanted to do at my house. And I again was confused as a kid. I was like, guys, like we can go play over here. Why are you so fixated on this? And now, years later, as a dietitian and someone who like, studies food behavior, much like you guys, I understand that the reason why this was such a novel experience for my friends and why they would eat so much candy and why their parents would maybe get a little angry at <laughs> my parents or our household is because that wasn't allowed in their house or there was a lot of language around food in their household where certain things were put on a pedestal at the expense of other foods. So I think that's just something to be mindful of for anyone, whether you have kids in your house or you're just around kids in your life to try as best as you can, knowing that this will differ for everyone, but try to create a more neutral experience around food and not place certain foods on a pedestal saying we can only have these Justin's peanut butter cups because then, I mean, kids are naturally very curious. So if they go out and they receive another kind of peanut butter cup that they've never seen, they've been told is bad, of course the inclination is going to be, can't tell mom and dad or my caregiver or I have to hide this or this is going to seem a thousand times better because mom said I can't, right? So I think it's, um, yeah, we just have to be really thoughtful in, in our, our wording on that. Can I meet your parents? <laughs> They're actually <laughs> visiting this week. I They're actually here. Do you want to bring them in? <laughs> because that's incredible. I mean, I remember just similarly quickly that, you know, when I would have friends come over, they would be so obsessed with the pop tarts at my house. Like we had pop tarts mm -hmm. for breakfast every day. Um, but I, I don't specifically remember, and I have a terrible memory of my childhood. I don't know why I had a great childhood, but I just like, don't have a ton of memories. Um, but I don't ever remember a specific conversation about food other than, you know, ice cream wise, we, it was just something we had every single night. And it's so interesting, um, just how that carries through through life. So thank you for that. And maybe we could have like a part three with you on just about <laughs> parenting so that your mom and dad can come on here and teach me some things, please. Like Wouldn't that be something? About. <laughs> something to think about for future. What do you think, Sam? <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I love how you brought in your own personal experience. And I can totally resonate with what you were talking about of like going over to other people's homes and um, like totally like brought me right back to my childhood as well. And I'm sure our listeners can relate whether they were the ones that had the similar childhood experiences as you did, or if they were the friends coming over and raiding the candy jar. So, mm -hmm. um, so Claire, for anybody listening, I'm sure they already follow you, but if they do <laughs> not already, where is the best place that they can find you? 
Yeah. So best place to find me, a couple different places, Instagram and TikTok. I hang out there most. If this is coming out around Halloween, I'm sure I will have some Halloween theme posts going on, but my handle there is just my name. So at Claire Tuning, uh, I also podcast much like you all, Sam and Jenna, you've both been on my podcast. We'll have to have you guys on again because after a while episodes get buried under a lot of others, but uh, the podcast is the Yours Truly podcast. And my website as well is just clairetuning.com. That should have all information on courses, how to work with me, et cetera. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much for, for having me and fall is my favorite season. So it has truly been a pleasure to talk my favorite fall season with you. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there, and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves, and follow along with us on social at what the actual fork pod we promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics greatest guests and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit we love you we appreciate you and we will see you next week for a lot more fun <laughs>